But I titled this series of messages, Why? And Other Unanswered Questions, Adventures in the Book of Job. And I want to start out, before we hit the unanswered questions, I want to start out with a few moments on some answered questions. Very easy. First of all, why ask why? Well, as human beings, we are designed to ask why. I've often heard pious folks, when facing some big suffering in their life, remark to me, well, we just shouldn't ask why. They're hoping that I, as their pastor, will invite them to ask questions and place their questions in the context of prayer and in connection with God. And that's what I do. But the logic of the remark is problematic. We just shouldn't ask why. Well, why is that? Is God threatened by our puny questions? I don't think so. Are we such a challenge to God that God prefers us to be silent? Uh, no. Or is asking a question a sign that we lack faith? I'd say no to that as well. In the section before us today, Job himself does not question Though, by the end of the book, he raises every possible question, certainly in chapter 3, which is the, this text in which he curses the day of his birth. In that chapter, he begins to ask the questions. But even in this text, in Job chapters 1 and 2, the book itself raises the questions for us. If we're to read it on face value, the reason Job suffers is because God and Satan have a bet going, and Job is the test case. Now, for me at least, that's a very unsatisfactory explanation for human suffering. What do I do? Why ask why? Second, answer the question. Why preach Job? It is such a downer. It is not. That's my short answer. My long answer to that is to elaborate a bit further with the story. I was talking to a woman. This is quite a number of years ago. Worship was about to begin, and she was refusing to enter. Her family was already in the worship space. And she just said to me, I'm not, I just don't want to go in there with those happy people. She was mad at God. She was mad at church people for being <laughs> happy, although she wasn't paying attention to enough of their individual stories to know that not everybody shows up happy every day. And she was mad at her own family for being church people on that day. At that moment for her, her pain and suffering was the only story worth telling. Well, I have to say, we are not a place for plastic people. Here at Christ Church, we talk about growing in a spirituality that is giving, faithful, and real. And there is this little thing that I like to call real life. And it happens to involve some suffering and pain. With apologies to Pharrell Williams, whose song I really do enjoy, making it through real life successfully is not about being happy. If we already understand happy as a plastic emotion at any rate, it's about resilience. And it's about discovering a joy beneath and through pain. Now, by the end of the book, Job has discovered a dignity and a glory in being human that goes far beyond the circumstances of his life. A blessing that is much more than a pain-free and wealthy existence that he has in the story. So, another story, not Job at all. Somebody's vacationing in Europe, seeing these classical sites, the cathedrals, the art museums. Goes to the cemetery where Beethoven is buried and stands before the, the tombstone. And as he's standing there, he hears music that is recognizable and yet different. It's Beethoven's fifth. It's being played backwards. Backwards? He says to the two of them, well, of course, Beethoven's decomposing. <laughs> yeah, you got that, right? Okay, so the growers, they're the best ones. Well, here's what, here's what Job does for us. Job decomposes or deconstructs, to use the fancy literary term, deconstructs conventional wisdom about God and suffering and about human existence. Job deconstructs even itself, its own text, in a very genius and beautiful way. So pay attention to that. Plan to be here for uh, the rest of the month as we work through Job. And please, I encourage you, read through it yourself. Job. His first two chapters. An amazing story. Job has everything and Job loses everything all in one day. We skip that part of the reading. He loses sheep, camels, 
ox and donkey's children. Now, interesting, if you flip to the end of the book, chapter 42, the last half of that chapter, Job gets everything back double. Double. He had 7,000 sheep in the beginning. At the end of the story, he has 14,000. He starts out with 3,000 camels, finishes with? He has 500 yoke of oxen. He ends up with? He has 500 donkeys. By the way, donkeys were like the Mercedes Benz of the ancient world. They were the high class mode of transportation. He has a thousand of them in his garage. Except for children. Interesting. Children don't double, at least not in the way the other things did. Children are irreplaceable. And though the text does not state this explicitly, children are immortal. What Job has is seven more sons and three more daughters for a total that is double his original total. Twenty kids. And at least in the story, Job only has one wife. And you wonder how she manages to have twenty children, but that's the story. Job has everything. Job loses everything. Job gains back double. And somehow, God is the one responsible for both the blessing and the pain. It's weird. It's disturbing. Especially the way it plays out behind the scenes. An amazing story. In fact, it is so amazing that this story shows up in several other ancient cultures in Egypt and Canaan and Babylon. All of them following a similar plot. A good man loses everything, gets it back, and the god or the gods are to blame. These stories in the other cultures, however, don't include what we have in the Bible. The almost 40 chapters of poetry that reflect on the nature and cause of suffering, on our relationship to God, and what it means to be most academics have concluded that the writer of the biblical Job used a pre-existing folk tale that was known in the ancient Near East to create this great classic. Now, whether or not that is so, it remains God's book. And so because of that, we should not simply explain away or remove the disturbing elements of the text. They exist to force us to ask out loud those questions that sometimes we just need to ask. Is Job a test case? For a God running a science experiment on human loyalty? Is Job an unwitting pawn in a wager between God and Satan? Well, no. But haven't we all wondered those things at some point in our lives? From the very beginning, the unknown author of the book of Job raises the most difficult questions about human suffering and lets them sit there unanswered. Let's us stew in that. Some of the issues become a bit more clear as we move through the book. Some don't. But the writer manages to address much deeper and more difficult questions than we, than we often fail to ask. For now, let's just set it book. Drawing us into the conversation will play out over the next 40 chapters of beautiful and daunting poetry. Now, the beauty of this book is in its language. And it is important to notice some of the most interesting features in this portion of the text, Job chapters 1 and 2. First of all, the Satan. Most of our English translations read Satan with a capital S as in a proper name. The Hebrew, however, reads literally the Satan as in a title or job function, the prosecutor, the district attorney, the Hebrew root is used other times in the Old Testament for human adversaries and for human adversarial behavior. It is not clear from this text that this is a reference to the enemy of God and the enemy of our souls, known more clearly in the rest of Scripture, the later writings, as Satan or the devil. Whatever way we read it, it is clear in the story that God is in charge, that God sets the rules and limits under which the Satan operates. 